Hi everyone, my name is Marek. Uh, I work at KV.com as a senior software engineer working in the Ancillaries mobile tribe. And today I'm gonna to talk about clean architecture with some usages or hints how to apply it on Android. All right, to kick this off, uh, here's a little motivational quote from Robert C. Martin, who's the author of the book Clean Architecture, is that every system provides two different values for their stakeholders, which is the behavior and uh, the structure. Behavior is uh, in layman's terms, put uh, what makes money or what saves money. It's the reason of being or every computer system. And structure is how, how we actually uh, structure the code, how we make the behavior happen. And um, in, in part, it's the, it's the resilient to changes. So it's like how, how easy is to modify uh, the system. Another one is that the goal of um, software architecture, or us as software engineers, is to minimize human resources required to build or maintain the system, which is kind of weird. It's sort of like if our job was to put ourselves out of the job, but um, um, in real life situations, it's, it's usually, um, you have way more priorities and, and features to ship than uh, available developers, so that's not really that much of an issue. All right, so what is clean architecture? Clean architecture is a term coined by Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, um, in his blog and various other events. And it's usually shown in, in this sort of like a dark target uh, uh, picture. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept or a, not even like a one architecture to, to implement and ship it or, or plug and play. Uh, it's more of a concept how to approach building uh, the so-called structure or architecture of any computer system. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the, the, its basics, um, what, are the, what are the key concepts, and in the second part, we're gonna talk more about Android. All right, so first of all, the terms so that we know that uh, we're, we're thinking the same thing or speaking about the same stuff, uh, module. Module is defined by clean architecture as the smallest unit of development which is a little tricky because usually in Android we, we talk about modules in the sense of gradual modules or sometimes in a dependency injection modules. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's the smallest unit of development in object-oriented languages. It's usually a class, uh, or in Java that would be a class. Kotlin is a little more complicated with top-level uh, functions, top-level variables, but uh, if you sort of think of it from a JVM point of view that everything has to be in a class, then I'm just gonna use the term class and there's also component. Uh, components are units of deployment. So it's a bunch of code that's being compiled together and then shipped together. Um, you can roughly think of the Gradle module. So I'm gonna use the terms class and component, which is kind of weird because I'm mixing them up. A little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. But these are unique uh, between, between the stuff that we're used to. So when I'm saying class, I mean like little class, give or take. And when I'm, when I'm using component, I usually mean Gradle module. All right. So um, any computer system can be decomposed into two major elements. There's policy and there's details. Uh, policy is uh, the business rules. Why do we make the system? What does the system actually do? So in case of, let's say, Betsys, it's the sport betting. In case of Kiwi, it's buying the flight tickets and um, the attached services to it. Uh, and then there's details, which is how do we approach it? And details can contain uh, network communication, protocols, UI, everything like that. Now here's a part uh, where I land the first truth bomb of the evening. Android is a detail, which is kind of weird because, hang on, like, you know, when I ask for a job, I ask for the job of Android engineer, and, um, you know, they ask me a bunch of Android questions. But um, the thing is, from the, from the standpoint of the clean architecture, uh, any kind of platform, any kind of SDK is actually a detail. Um, and policies should be irrelevant to the details in case of uh, structuring the code. All right, so when I'm talking about classes or from clean architecture uh, modules, uh, there are these solid principles. Originally, they were uh, sorted a little differently, but then somebody had the bright idea to arrange them like so, so they would spell solid, at least the, the first letters, so they're more easy to remember. I'm gonna go briefly uh, through them. There's the singular responsibility principle which is a corollary to Conway's law, which Marek mentioned in the first talk. So just a, just a brief recap, uh, uh, the, the code naturally tends to structure the same way 
that are the communication lines of a company. So if you have a punk startup where everybody just does whatever they want and there are no clear lines of communication, the code is gonna look up the same. If you have, if you remember the example from the first talk, there were these three tribes where, uh, you know, uh, it was like acquisition shop and I can't remember the third one. So the code is probably gonna be structured, structured very similarly. If you would look at our code base and our uh, modules, packages and so on and so forth, we are divided into five tribes. And with some leeway, I could, I sh I could be able to draw just four lines and, and say, okay, the, this is the code base that uh, these tribes maintain. Um, although the lines might be a little squiggly because accidents happen. Uh, <laughs> But uh, single responsibility principle is often misquoted as a class should do one thing and should do one thing well. It's not really true. It's more of like uh, each class should have one stakeholder or one reason to change. So it should serve one master, right? Um, I'm gonna mention it a little later. What does it actually mean? Uh, yeah, uh, the open close principle states that in order to um, change the system, we should be able to modify the behavior of the system by writing new code rather than changing the existing code. Changing the existing code is usually using some dirty tricks such as function pointers in non-objective languages or reflection, so uh, none of that. Uh, famously coined by Bertrand Meyer in the 1980s. Uh, Barbara Liskov coined the Liskov substitution principle in 1988. This one's really easy. It says uh, that um, um, computer systems should be built of replaceable parts. In object-oriented languages, we usually do it by uh, implementing abstract, ab uh, abstract classes or interfaces or in case of the Swift and iOS protocols. Uh, the interface segregation principle, that's another one that most of us probably know. Uh, if you ever, for example, worked with um, Java collections or Kotlin collections, you have the bunch of these very small interfaces, iterable, enumerable, countable, you know, that sort of thing. So in case you have like a big fat interface that provides 25 methods uh, to multiple clients and none of them uses all of them, you should probably, you know, just chop it up into a few smaller ones and then you can still implement it all in like one uh, complex uh, class or complex object, but uh, Give your, give your um, dependees just what they need and not much else because it's a, it's a, a frequent cause of a mistake. All right, the dependency inversion principle, it's a little tricky, I'll try to explain it. If you sort of imagine um, you know, from your CS class, like the code written in C or program written in C, uh, you have the main function that runs the entire thing and then the main function calls another function and that one calls another and so on and so forth. So this is the direction of control and the dependency inversion, inversion principle says that the dependencies should be inverted to the case of control. So let's say the uh, detail-like uh, should, should depend on policies and not vice versa, if I, if I go back to the original uh, division. All right, so what do we do? Uh, our job, whenever somebody wants to build a computer system, is to chop it up, divide into hierarchy of components. There are the high level components and the lower level components. Uh, and the higher level components that contain the policy or the reason for the system existing are protected from the lower level components and from their changes. That's the main idea of clean architecture. All right, there are some rules which I picked for uh, component coupling. I'm gonna go very briefly through them. There's just three. There's the acyclic dependencies principle. This one is a freebie because Gradle doesn't allow it. So no cycles, boom, uh, we can take that off the list. Uh, depending on the direction of stability, there's a, there's a, there's a little equation. Uh, the E stands for instability. Uh, the fan out is a number of uh, dependencies that depend on this, I believe, right? And the fan in is number of the uh, dependencies that your module depends on. So for example, if you remember Mark's example, like way down there uh, at the bottom of the, of the chart, there was the shared core that didn't depend on anything. That's the component with zero instability uh, because it doesn't depend on anything, um, give or take. And then on the very top, there was the iOS app and the app uh, uh, modules, uh, sorry, not modules, components uh, that had 100% instability because they transitively depend on everything in the app. All right, 
And then there's this, this rule that says a component should be as abstract as it is stable. There's also an equation for abstractness and it's basically number of abstract classes and interfaces or for uh, iOS people protocols uh, compared to NC which stands for number of all classes or all um, or, or units in, in not um, object oriented languages. And the rule states that the uh, component should be as abstract as it is stable. So you kind of have this like a linear, linear uh, line. And if your score for uh, one is starting to divert a lot from the other, then it's probably something wrong and you should uh, think of refactoring the component into something smaller because it's probably doing uh, too many things at once. So uh, how do we set up a good architecture? Good architecture is independent and it's independent of the following things. It's independent of frameworks. This one is usually a little easier to say than do uh, because there are some frameworks which or libraries which are, uh, let's say, industry standards and the developers are used to them. If you recruit new talent, they're used to using these, these uh, tools as well. Uh, but um, the core of the architecture should not depend on any kind of framework or, and I'm going to mention a little later, it should be uh, sort of like a choice. It should be testable. This is pretty much a given in a host target environment, such as mobile development. Host target is when you develop the code on one machine, usually a laptop like this or some kind of uh, PC, and then uh, you run or execute the, the code on other device, such as smartphone, tablet, TV, smartwatch, etc. Uh, it should be testable without any kind of external device, without any kind of prerequisite, which makes it very easy to run the test and then the test can execute on, let's say, CI pipelines and so on. It should be independent of the UI. Um, well, UI is a detail, as I, as I believe mentioned previously. And it, it doesn't really change as much as, for example, um, in, let's say, front-end world, where every two years there's a new savior kind of library that uh, uh, tells us, yeah, this is the new way how to do the UI. Um, we kind of went just from um, view framework to compose, or if you, uh, to quote uh, Wayne from Wayne's World, if you're feeling saucy, you can use something completely crazy like drawing on a canvas. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be um, wrapped up into your core architecture. Independent of the database, it's not really applicable to Android that much or mobile development altogether because we don't really have that much of a choice of a database. We kind of stuck with SQLite or I guess you can, you can dump um, a binary for, I don't know, Mongo or something like that. Um, and independent of any external agency, which means this is kind of like the outside events that you have hard time to um, touch from, from the code base. So for example, if, if your app is only releasable every Monday or once a year, or if uh, there's only one person who can actually um, make head or tails of your code base, then it's not a clean architecture. It should be independent of external factors that are not in the code. All right. There's always an exception to the rule, uh, which in this case is the dirty main. Uh, dirty as opposed to clean. Um, there's no innuendo. Um, the main component is sort of the glue that ties the uh, entire app together. In mobile environment, I think it should be called more like a dirty app as, as, um, as the uh, Gradle module that is um, being created by Android Studio when you start a new project. But the point is, uh, this is where all of the stuff that doesn't really fit anywhere else in the app goes, your dependency injection, your framework initializations, um, you know, tracking, that kind of stuff um, that doesn't really belong anywhere else and doesn't really fit the architecture from any, any standpoint. All right, so that's enough theory. What about Android? I got another quote, this time from uh, James Grenning. Um, who wrote this in the King Architecture book that uh, if we write uh, uh, code that's only applicable or, or strongly tied to Android SDK or Android APIs, then we're basically writing a firmware because it cannot live anywhere else other than Android uh, the family of devices. All right, so how do we avoid this? Uh, this one is an oldie, a um, little bit of reminiscing um, of a um, middle-aged guy, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, in 2011, I picked up this wonderful book by Marco Murphy, and it was a second printing, so it contained uh, the wonderful, cool hotness from 2009. 
which was the APIs for Android 1.5. So it was an updated version. And um, you know, after browsing through the, uh, you know, uh, how to make a button, how to make a text view, and all this uh, stuff that everybody has to go through, um, I went to the nitty gritty of the really fun stuff, which is let's download something from the internet and display it in the app. And um, the examples that I found in either book like this or Stack Overflow or even developers.android.com at the time were something similar like this. Um, all right, obviously when I show this to one of our most senior colleagues uh, and I asked the um, rhetorical question, what's wrong with this picture? He said everything with a horrified face. But um, the horrible, horrible async task uh, that's gonna crash the app if you, if you, rotate, the, um, if you rotate the display um, aside. Um, the main point why I'm, why I'm showing you this is who's the stakeholder of uh, this class? Who does it serve for? So it's an activity, it definitely does your UI, right? So for UI, probably your UX designer is your stakeholder, right? This is the guy or gal who um, brings you changes. Turn this button from green to blue because we have a design update or this is, this is how we do buttons now. Um, it also does business logic, right? It goes against some kind of uh, network, probably downloads something, probably parses something so whoever is responsible for the data structure, probably your data guy, um, is also a stakeholder, right? Um, it parses the data into something usable, and then in the on-post execute stuff, it posts the data into the, the text view. So everybody who is a stakeholder of the app is a stakeholder of this particular uh, class. Now, the situation on Android was a little weird because it was a little bit of Wild West in the beginning. Uh, not only that we don't really have any, we didn't even really have any, let's say, guides or hints how to actually write the apps properly. Uh, there were even limitations, right? There was a limitation in number of classes and there was limitation in number of methods. So if you really wanted to do something crazy like, uh, you know, uh, functional programming with, with like really complicated callbacks or have a bunch of factories and lots of tests and it, you might run into some kind of um, uh, limitation issues. But um, it's not like Android didn't really enforce anything, any patterns. Uh, they started to clear out the Wild West slightly, but they, I think, started from the wrong side. Um, if you remember, list view was later replaced by recycler view and then um, uh, there were other patterns such as uh, enforced view holder bindings and, and such. Uh, but these were mostly for the UI efficiency and not really, uh, not really uh, regarding the architecture. All right, this is another quote from uh, Robert C. Martin. It's like, yeah, yeah when, when you, when you kind of start up, either in a small company or you're, you're, you're self-teaching yourself a technology, your enthusiasm probably vastly overwhelms your skills. So uh, you just start with these like godlike objects uh, that do everything because uh, you don't want the impediment of a superstructure, right? All right, so um, what was the progress? I remember about 2015, um, there, was a, there was a framework called Mosby uh, named after a popular character from a uh, TV show, How I Met Your Mother, that tried to champion the uh, model view, uh, sorry, model presenter uh, view, or model view presenter rather. Um, there were articles about it, some people tried to utilize it, didn't really make that much of a splash compared to godlike objects. Um, since it was a third party library, you know, it had a hard time sort of becoming industry standard and so on. Um, on the other side of the aisle, in the iOS development, uh, MVC was encouraged and supported uh, pattern how to do things. Um, and then around 2017, uh, Google decided to finally do something about it, and they introduced the uh, Android architecture components with view models, observable live data, and said, that, yeah, this is the way. Uh, and so many people jumped on the bandwagon because um, I don't know if you, were, if you were developers at the time or if you remember it, uh, but yeah, this was like a spring of holy water. Uh, onto a dying person because suddenly it was like, how, how, could, I, how could I have been writing this crap all this time? Um, 
Um, and yeah, we were one of the few ones who, who just adopted it while it was even in beta, because um, it was awesome. And we believed that this will solve all of our problems. Well, not really, because the three letter or four letter architectural patterns, they, they all kind of suffer from the same thing. If you look at the diagram, view is really easy, right? That's, that's the stuff that's being shown on the screen. Everybody can identify a view. Model is also very easy. Those are my data, the, the, the stuff that pumps the data someplace. And everything else is a view model. So instead of 3,000 line activities that do everything, we ended up with 3,000 line uh, view models that dot they do almost everything. Um, <clears throat> all right, so how to get out of this mess? Uh, if, we're, if you see this picture, it's very similar to the original uh, one, but this one is in black and white. And it also eliminated one of the rings of protection, which was the enterprise layer. It doesn't really have that much of a usage, let's say in mobile, or, or you know, um, doesn't really apply that much. Um, so how can we apply the concepts of the clean architecture that says that um, you know, higher level uh, components should be protected from the lower level components? All right, so uh, the domain layer. The clean architecture doesn't really prescribe any number of layers that you have to use in your app. You can use more than I'm gonna uh, talk about here. You can even use less, uh, but this one is at your own risk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention it just a few slides later. As you can see, there's a little Kotlin sign uh, next to the domain, which is supposed to um, denote that um, um, it should be pure Kotlin. There shouldn't be any kind of Android SDK or, or any Android specific libraries as dependencies to our domain layer. So this is your, this is your policy. This is where the reason why your system lives uh, go to, right? The domain classes. These are your high level, high, high, highest level components that should be protected from all the details. Right. Uh, oftentimes in domain layers, there are uh, these classes implemented called use cases. Uh, previously, they were called interactors, but uh, I never really, I never really got, um, or some people call them interactors, let's say. I don't think the name really caught on that much. Anyway, um, use cases are kind of, um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the gist of the system, right? They should do one thing, they should do one thing fairly well. It should be, it should be one completable, um, easy to develop, easy to test part of the system. Um, Aaron Bujna, which is uh, one of the authors I'm gonna talk about at the, at the end of the lesson, um, um, has a very robust structure for how to implement use cases, including uh, base classes and, and use case executors and, and complicated threading. In Kiwi, we opted for something really, really simple. It's just a SAM, single access method uh, objects, very similar to functors, if you know functors from uh, C++. And there's always either a return flow or they're suspending. So it's up to the, it's up to the uh, caller to figure out the threading themselves. All right, and there's the presentation layer. Once again, purely Kotlin. Uh, the goal of the presentation layer is to crunch the data into something that's really easy, presentable by the UI. Now, um, like I said, um, skipping a layer can might come at your own risk, at uh, serious pain at some point. But um, if I were to talk from my experience, like for example, if you go to the Kiwi app and you go to the last step before the checkout, we offer a third party service called LHub Plus. And if you would look into the data structures, it's just a price basically. And one Boolean that doesn't really mean anything. Um, it just filters out the, whether the offer is available and it's always reported as true. So um, if your data is that simple, it doesn't really make much sense to put in boilerplate code um, uh, to map it from some kind of domain class into a presentation class and so the UI can uh, crunch it, or you, UI can easily display it. It's sort of like pre-formatted by design. Um, but that's more of my opinion rather than the authors I'm gonna speak at the end. All right. Um, once again, uh, the, the layers have some kind of mappers between them. Uh, you separate the dependencies or you separate the layers by providing different uh, models. There are domain models and percentage model on, on each side, and then you pass them on to the UI. All right, UI, that's uh, probably the one that everybody's familiar with. Um, these are your fragments, your composables, your um, um, 
uh, view bindings, data bindings, uh, fragments, so on and so forth. Um, pretty easy, nothing really to see here. Um, up until recently, there was only pretty much one choice how to do it. Now it's, uh, the compo seems to be all the rave. Um, this is a good test of your skills, like for example, um, or rather your architecture than your skills. Um, in Kiwi, we opted out for switching our entire ancillary's code base from uh, view framework into compose. If you're having a good time and it goes fairly easy, it means that your architecture is, is pretty good. Uh, if not, then you might have some issues in, in the um, higher uh, uh, layers. All right. So we were going from the domain layer upwards, now we're going uh, downwards. Um, the data source layer, once again, this has Android dependencies. Uh, this might be a little tricky, but um, if you really think about it, this could be your database, right? That could be a data source, uh, something that touches the uh, system SQLite. It could be a network data source, which once again, probably needs some kind of uh, system networking, either uh, you do it yourself or using one of those, uh, one of those libraries that utilize the Android networking. Um, or it could be something uh, completely different. Like for example, Aaron Buchna had a great case where even permission handling can be a data source and you can approach it as a data source because it's a sort of information that's coming from the platform itself and you can query it and you can modify it. Um, the data layer, um, this is sometimes packed together with a data source layer sort of depends um, who's, who's drawing the diagram, but um, this is fairly simple. It just maps the data source layer. For example, if you're, if you're pulling some kind of JSON data and you're using some kind of uh, parsing libraries such as JSON, Moshi, or Kotlin accelerization, uh, your data source classes would contain the annotations for easy processing. The data layer is, is uh, stripped out of these uh, uh, needless annotations and the data is more uh, pure and usable for the uh, domain layer. All right, so um, the good question is, I talked about two things. I talked about the proposal from Robert C. Martin, who proposes clean architecture, and I've, I talked about the industry standard, which is uh, the our MVVM architecture components. So do I have to pick one or the other? Uh, where does the VMoto go? Um, they don't really go against each other. You can, can use both concepts. Uh, you sort of think of the view model as an interface layer between uh, your use cases and between your views. That's kind of it. Even though um, some authors argue that uh, the um, uh, architecture components view model breaks some of the rules stated in clean architecture, but you don't have to use it if you don't have to. Uh, sorry, if you don't want to. All right. Uh, before I go to the sources, um, I'm going to talk about one more thing because I'm fairly decent on time. Um, to quote Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until get, they get punched in the face. So everybody has a clean architecture until they started implementing DI. Um, I mentioned in the, in the beginning that DI should go into the uh, dirty main or a dirty app uh, module. Uh, but if you really look at it, um, if you really look at, for example, uh, frameworks like Dagger or, or um, Hilt, they, they just put annotations everywhere and that just pollutes the overall architecture wherever they go. It's sort of like a corruption that just spreads throughout the code base. So can I have a clean architecture even if I use one of these frameworks? Um, yes, kind of. Um, the way that uh, Robert C. Martin describes it, it's sort of like a marriage. It's like once you marry a certain framework, you're probably stuck with him uh, forever or you have to remove it um, later at a um, serious pain. Uh, so the, it's not like you cannot use any framework and you have to write everything yourself. It's sort of like conscious decision and to realize that once, you're, once you pick a certain framework, um, it might be a good idea if it brings great value and um, in case of let's say Dagger, Hilt or, or Coin, um, these are great frameworks that can, that can um, save a lot of time. Um, but once you make your pick, you're probably stuck with the framework at, uh, until the end of the application life cycle. All right, uh, so the sources, or where did I, uh, where did I get this um, information from? Uh, there's the original book, Clean Architecture. 
It was originally posted as a series of blog posts starting from about 2011, 2012, and then in 2017, Addison Wesley Pearson published his book. Um, I liked it, uh, but um, it's got way worse reviews than the previous ones in the series, in the Robert C. Martin series, uh, which were uh, Clean Code and Clean Coder. And it's because only about a third of the book is actually about clean architecture. It's about 400 pages. And the other two thirds are sort of like, I used to be a developer in a, in a telephone company in the 70s and we used to write horrible code. So uh, if that's kind of your stuff, um, you might have fun like me. Uh, other than that, okay. Uh, there's this one. Uh, by English author Erin Bujnat. This was released uh, this year by BPB Publication. Um, it's interesting, which is what people say when something is not really that good. Um, no, it, it's great. It's very clean. But um, um, if you know who preppers are, uh, those kind of people who like build uh, bomb shelters and stock up on ammunition, food, clean water and stuff, uh, the app um, described in, in, in this book will survive everything. Is if Google um, decides to chuck compost tomorrow, this, nothing phases it. Uh, if um, our MVVM architecture components are discontinued, no worries. Uh, this guy does everything by himself. Uh, it's fun. It's just I had a little issue thinking um, maybe Maybe the motivation for writing this book is just to be able to say, to tell the, the junior developers in the same company why they have to use this framework. Um, and then there's this one, um, uh, Clean Android Architecture, not to be confused with Clean Architecture for Android, uh, by <laughs> Romanian author uh, uh, Alexander Dumbraven. And it's good, it's just kind of not for me, um, which, um, I was a little harsh when I was doing this talk like three weeks ago. Um, this one probably is the winner. If you have a junior dev who kind of like doesn't have that much experience, um, like um, you know how to write Kotlin, uh, but uh, get confused like what goes where and what, why shouldn't this be in the view model? Uh, this is a very, very uh, good introduction into the topic. But uh, if you want to learn something like more substantial or more deep, um, it barely uh, scratches the surface, and it's PackPub, which is uh, known for dumping like um, lots of lots of code into their books. So if you would strip it down, it's basically uh, 100 pages of, of real text. All right, um, that's kind of it. Uh, that's me. Uh, we're supposed to promote ourselves, so yeah, I'm on WhatsApp. Um, I'm not very much on social, but you can try uh, a Twitter handle, and that's my email, and that's the Kiwi website because it was in the template. <laughs> All right, thanks. This was fun.